Sure. Well, um, I, I've worked on The Guardian for about 20 years, and I spent much of the time abroad, including four years in Russia, until I was booted out in 2011. Uh, and th I, I wrote Collusion, I guess, for two reasons. One, I met Christopher Steele, the former MI6 spy who wrote the famous dossier on Donald Trump and his links with Russia, which was published at the beginning of 2017, sort of setting off this huge scandal, which is still with us. Uh, and the other reason was, I think, to try and explain that what happened in the US election of two years ago, uh, and indeed what's happening now, sort of ongoing attempts by Russia to subvert Western democracy, has a backstory. In other words, these are kind of classic KGB methods, which you can see all the way through the Cold War, which have been updated for, the, for our era of Facebook and Twitter. So I wanted to kind of explain, I wanted to tell a thrilling story, and also wanted to historicize. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, so I suppose, what does it what does it mean? You know, that it, the book was published back in November last year, and obviously there's been updates to that story. It's an <coughs> ongoing drama, if you like. Um, but what does it mean, do you think, for the book, but also the whole idea of collusion between uh, the Russian government and the Trump administration for not just those two countries, but for kind of global politics as well? Well, uh, I mean, uh, the book has, I, I would like to think, has sort of stood up pretty well. Uh, there's a new um, updated edition which has just come out this week, and actually nothing in it has, has been proven wrong. Uh, meanwhile, lots of Donald Trump's uh, associates, like Paul Manafort, for example, his campaign manager, have ended up in jail or admitted lying to the FBI. And I think what, what we're seeing, and it was actually General Mike Hayden who, 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 who said this, not, not, not a Guardian reader, the former head of the CIA and NSA, uh, is that in America, uh, we witnessed really one of the greatest espionage operations in history where in a very close election between Trump and Hillary Clinton, Russia was pushing, pushing, pushing Donald Trump, hacking material, leaking it to, to uh, sort of boost him and to, 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 to smash Hillary down. Uh, this was very, very successful and essentially it's part of, I would say, I would argue, Russia's attempts to reshape the world, to make Russia a kind of global um, maximal power and also to try and this sounds a bit hyperbolic, but I think it's true in some way to kind of bring down Western democracy. I mean, I suppose, how, how well would you say that's going for Russia at the moment? We've just in the past week seen uh, members of the GRU being identified as the, uh, the men who came and, and to have allegedly poisoned Sergei Skripal and Salisbury. I mean, it's not been a great week of press for, for them. So how, how well do you think that's working for Russia at the moment? Well, I, I mean, I think, it, I think it's mixed. Uh, I think the, the Skripal case, which is eerily similar to the Litvinenko case, so I wrote a book about the, the poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko in 2006 called A Very Expensive Poison. Uh, I, I mean, it's not good having the identities of your undercover GIU intelligence officers exposed. We now know who they are. One of them is called Alexander Mishkin, who's a sort of medical doctor. The other, Colonel Anatoly Chapiga, that they flew in on false names and, and genuine passports but false names and they said they went to Salisbury twice to see its beautiful spa and they had to turn back on day one because of this ferocious slush. Now, now Mishkin comes from permafrosted northern Russia where there's snow on the ground for 10 months of the year and obviously all of this stuff is embarrassing for Vladimir Putin but uh, I think <clears throat> in a way it doesn't matter. I mean, he, he will just shrug and the GRU will continue its subversive operations everywhere. And the point is that the challenge for Western governments is what do you do uh, about a rogue state like Russia, because I think Russia is a rogue state, that sends hit squads uh, all over Europe and elsewhere to rub out people it doesn't like, and tries to hack material and influence elections and sort of push the far left and the far right. Uh, and in that, I think Russia has been more successful um, and, and really has, has um, played a kind of formidable role in, in trying to kind of foster divisions inside the UK and elsewhere. Yeah, and just on that sort of hacking of elections, um, I know that there have been some links drawn between uh, the Russian government and the Leave.eu campaign. Um, I think there were surprises, it was perhaps a surprise that there wasn't more in the German election. Sort of some people expected mm -hmm. there to be sort of more evidence of Russian hacking. And uh, we were talking earlier about even the Mexican election potentially being influenced. I mean, do you think that these are all also like claims that can be founded, uh, or do they still need sort of more work to uncover them? Well, I, I mean, the, the, the Kremlin's got kind of global ambitions. We, we know just from the, the, the flight 
patterns of these GRU guys, four of whom were recently kind of um, uh, sort of arrested in, in The Hague and kind of pinged back to Moscow, that, that they are international, they work everywhere. Does that mean that they are invincible and they, they always get things right? No, it doesn't. Quite often their, their tradecraft is pretty amateurish. But is there a sort of a, a plot, a kind of linear ambition? Uh, yeah, I think, I, think, I think there is. Um, as far as Brexit goes, I think this is a really intriguing question. I mean, I've reported on this with, with colleagues, most notably Cal Cadwallader from The Observer. Um, what we've discovered is a major <coughs> operation uh, run out of the Russian embassy in London to try and push Brexit. And there were, we now know there were multiple meetings between the Russian ambassador, Yakovenka, and Aaron Banks, including the day that LeVU launched. And the big question marks about where Banks got his nine million pounds from, with which he funded LeVU. Now, he says, nothing to see here. This is all perfectly legal. But what, what I find um, slightly <coughs> disturbing is the fact that, that no one in government wants to interrogate this question, did Russia try and influence Brexit, the outcome of the referendum. And actually the Labour Party as well, with a few exceptions, is not greatly interested. And it's left to journalists to investigate this. And I think there's still more to come. I, mean, I suppose that's one, one of the problems with sort of politics today. It seems to me, at least, particularly in the case of your book and, and Trump and Putin, that there's accountability just doesn't seem to stick with these guys in the sense that you can write a book that has had no, as you say, no one's sort of come out and said anything's wrong with it, but Trump can just decry it as fake news and he'll move on and his supporters will sort of allow that to happen. And so is there a danger that even though there's all this building up of information, is it ever, are we ever going to see these people in power held to account? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, but I think there's sort of two separate processes going on. One is the process of truth-telling, if you like, and, and trying to get to the truth. And I, I mean, the truth. I, kind of, I believe in this sort of unitary truth, not kind of multiple truths. Uh, and that's being led by journalists, it's being led by online activists, it's being led by newspapers like the New York Times and also my paper, The Guardian. Uh, and also, um, of course, it's being led by Robert Mueller, the special um, prosecutor is investigating collusion between Donald Trump and Russia, and he's already indicted a whole heap of people. So that, that's the kind of investigatory process, some of which is open, some of which is secret. And it's, it's difficult, it's frustrating, Occasionally we get something new and we reveal it and it's it's great, but that's entirely separate from the kind of political dynamic which in America at least um, sees Donald Trump still in power, sees his base believing that he's the victim of a, of a plot by the deep state and by evil liberals um, and it's by no means a foregone conclusion he's going to be removed from office or even voted out. We, we, we don't know. I mean, the US is, is in the grip of what you might call a kind of cold civil war and, and is, is having an authoritarian moment. I think there's no doubt about that. And these populist forces are everywhere. Uh, Right-wing, anti-immigrant, uh, nationalist, sometimes ultra-nationalist parties are on the march, whether it's in Italy or Brazil or Poland or Hungary or I would say here, where English nationalism is up, up, up. I mean, the Conservative Party might, might not frame itself as an English nationalist, but it is. Um, so we live, in, we live in precarious and, I would say, dangerous times. And all we can do as, as journalists, as citizens, is to try and investigate and to publish information that is accurate and true. Mm. And just going back <coughs> to the, the book again, just, uh, was it, I mean, it must have been quite exciting. You know, it starts off with meeting Christopher Steele, who's an MI6 agent, it's like something out of a Bond film. There was also a really nice anecdote of uh, Sean Walker meeting a source on a river in an unnamed European city. <coughs> yeah, he was like, wearing a floral shirt, right, yeah. and they had rode out to the middle to get away from eavesdropping. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that level of paranoia at the moment when dealing with sources is understandably quite high. Yeah, and, and I suppose but some of the research for, that, for this book, but also <coughs> all the other work you're doing now, is it, is it quite... Do you find it all quite exciting, or is it, have you got used to that, those kinds of meetings? No, it's quite exciting. I mean, it is quite exciting, and we're dealing with kind of multiple sources. But the thing is, what you have to understand is that this is a sort of diffuse business. In other words, you, it's, it's not quite like Watergate, where you go and meet a, a, a secret source in a car park, and he tells you everything, and that's it. I mean, we've got, I've got sort of you know, different sources, and plus I'm working with colleagues who are, who are great, and also with, with other groups of international journalists who are pursuing different parts of this story. So I've been in Prague recently, uh, working on a project I can't tell you about, um, and 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 also a lot of stuff kind of comes to me. People kind of email me, and and uh, some of whom are crazy, some of whom are not. So it, it, it is thrilling. 
but it feels like running a marathon and I sort of think we're <coughs> we've maybe hit the sort of 10 12 kilometer mark I don't think we're any, anywhere near the finishing line yet mm. and also <laughs> just uh, you were uh, Moscow uh, head of the Moscow Bureau for the Guardian in 2007 2011 I think yeah that's right, right. And then yeah. you were expelled from the country by the government um, what what was that experience like first of all but also what do you feel about that now and do you ever feel like a person who may be under threat obviously we've even seen this past week a couple <coughs> of journalists have been murdered in eastern europe and, and there's there's that constant threat with this profession i just wonder how you find sort of dealing with that risk yeah i, I mean i think it's grim times for journalists and and it's uh, unbelievable that journalists um can be murdered in malta in in, in bulgaria um in it seems in turkey uh, and this is happening kind of in the, the sort of 21st century. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a dangerous profession. Um, and um, I certainly did lots of war in my career. I reported from Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria, and Libya, uh, Ukraine, Georgia. I mean, I've done plenty of conflict. Um, but <clears throat> I think what makes me reasonably sanguine about about Russia. Uh, about my sort of personal situation is that the, 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 the sort of Russian spy agencies tend to target opposition Russian activists or people they deem to be traitors. In other words, it's Russians who are, who are falling into the mincer. Um, and their assumption is that all Western journalists, but especially Brits and Americans, are spies, that I'm a kind of scruffy James Bond here in Wimbledon. Uh, and so they have rules for, <clears throat> for dealing with foreign spies, which is to sort of, you can hound them, you can troll them, you can entrap them, you can bug them, which happened to me and my family in Moscow. But generally you don't kill them. Um, so, um, so, I mean, I, all I would say is that I, I would like to salute the Russians in this story, the, the, the activists, human rights campaigners and so on, and, and journalists, especially in the provinces. You know, many of whom have been killed or, or, or intimidated or beaten up because they're the heroes of this story. And I suppose just then to, to sort of finish up, what would, would, do you have a sort of, not necessarily, I don't want to say a prediction, but sort of a, a sort of forecast on how this scenario plays out? I mean, we're uh, in the midst of Trump's first term. Are we going to, well, <coughs> and we're potentially in the midst of Putin's last term. Um, what, what do you see happening in the next couple of years? Well, I mean, it, it, it's, different be, it's difficult being predictive, but uh, I think what one can say is that it's quite possible to see Trumpism and Putinism continuing without Trump and Putin. In other, in other words, I think these guys would like to be immortal and, and rule for a thousand years, and it's like, like a sort of pharaoh. Uh, and neither of them are especially young men, so they can't go on forever, but, but the, these forces, um, especially in the US and not going away any, anytime soon if, if Trump is, is, does step down or is removed, which I think is still relatively unlikely, I think it's most likely he'll be voted out, but it's also possible he could win again, uh, then you can see sort of neo-Trumpian actors taking the stage. So um, uh, I think it's not kind of let's get rid of the bad guy and our problems go away. I think we are living in a new and chaotic and unstable era, which in some respects is, it's not the 1930s, but there are, there are elements which are similar with that. And I think our, our democracy feels more fragile th than ever. So I think we just have to um, recognize that times are bleak. I think we have to stay cheerful. We have to carry on uh, and be nice to each other, banal though that seems, um, but have good method and be empirical uh, and actually recognize what is true and what is false. Recording, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>